turn your attention to the 13th chapter of Mark, and we're going to read from the Word of the Lord, beginning at the 19th verse. And I want you to notice something that I bring to your attention tonight. I want to speak on the subject, the possibility of the elect being deceived. And I would like for you to consider the very importance of the kind of a time we're living in when Satan is having his last fling at the church. He's going to try his best, but he's a defeated foe. There's no doubt about that. He was defeated in the long ago at Calvary, and he's still trying. When the Bible says that he was made an open show, when the Lord was made an open show and spectacle before all powers and principalities, and he came forth out of that condition more than a conqueror. That tells us we've got a victorious gospel. And there's no reason why we shouldn't think victoriously. But I would like to draw your attention to some things that are vital to us as a people. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time. Neither shall it be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, who he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Second Thessalonians 2 and 15 is a very unique scripture because I don't know of any scripture in the New Testament that is phrased and framed in this language. Traditions the word traditions is used here very uniquely. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, there are some good traditions. There are some good traditions, but then in Colossians 2 and 8 we are warned about other types of traditions, and I'd like for you to just note the parallel. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Praise God for His Word. My Lord Jesus, it's yours. It's your precious word. And we love it. We thank you for it. We glorify your name for it. It's our anchor. It's our foundation. It's our strength. And we thank you for giving it to us. And the precious name now speak to all the people that are here tonight. And we'll thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. As I've already stated to you, there are some traditions that are not harmful. Paul talks about traditions in two lights. Some are good, some are bad. When he talks about the traditions of men, philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world. He is talking about the kind 
and philosophy that is generated by the thinking of man's intellectualism. And then he was also talking to us about the beautiful things that are taught to us in the New Testament. I believe that it's great for the church to have communion service. I believe that we need foot washing every once in a while. I think it serves the purpose of humbling our hearts in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. And it has a unique and beautiful relationship to Christian service. It's interesting when you start reading the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, how Paul starts that portion of scripture out. And I think maybe sometimes we have failed to recognize the way that 11th chapter begins, but I'd just like to call it to your attention to show you what Paul is speaking about when he talks about the matter of holding fast the traditions you've been taught. Be you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's a safe, safe position for the people of God. I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And then he launches into a discussion or an exegesis on the matter of hair for women and men. And if you are not acquainted with our generation, and I'm sure you are, hair is our big problem, whether it be with women or men. And it's a problem than you think it is, because the situation has even gotten to the sporting fraternity and has caused divisive issues there. Some baseball managers, they tell me, have actually insisted on clean-cut men playing for them in regard to their appearance. So that it's strange that the church is not the only place where this has a discussion. I was at the president's breakfast one day in January, several years ago, when the Purdue Glee Club came in to sing. Purdue University was in Purdue, Indiana. And when these young men walked in, they were as clean-cut as I have ever seen of American young men. And I talked to one of them when it was over, I asked one of the men, and by the way, when they did walk in, the whole crowd made the observation, that's a clean-cut group of young Americans. And I asked one of the young men who was singing, I said, I noticed that your hair is uh, rather short and the usual type of hair that you find on men in these days. He said, oh, yes. He said, you can't belong to the Purdue Greek Club if your hair is not above your ears and it's touching the collar of your shirt. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, is this a demand? He said, a demand? If we come in any other way once and we're out. I was amazed. I said, you mean a secular school makes a demand like that on you? He said, yes. I said, why? He said, they don't want us identified with the hippie culture in any way, shape, form, or manner. And so I said, why is that? He said, because it is related to the drug culture and they want nothing to do with it. Now that's a very amazing thing. 
Now, I want you to note in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it's talking about ordinances, and I believe that you will agree with me that communion is an ordinance. Do I hear any amen? I believe that. Well, if communion is an ordinance in the 11th chapter, what about a hair in the first part of the chapter? So you see, we, we have some concepts about God that may look apparently strange in the eyes of the people, but is very scripturally sound. And when we take our stand on matters of this nature, Somebody said, is all of this necessary? And they talk in this fashion. I have discovered in my pastoral and my uh, evangelistic ministry through the years that it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. I found that when people begin to go away from God, they begin in little areas of their life to begin to let down, and then finally it ends up in some kind of severe outburst of tragic moral sin. Now, if you want to follow that kind of thinking through the years, all you have to do is sit and observe and you'll see it come to pass. And because these things, we teach and preach a position of tradition, traditions that are good for people. And I stand in pulpits and preach to youth and tell them that it's not good for a man to touch a woman. Young men and women look at me so strangely. Because our generation has become so permissive that they have let down the bars to such an extent that familiarity is becoming the vogue of the times. The church is the only institution left in the world that takes a stand on matters that pertains to over-familiarity between the sexes. And there is few and far between. It is coming to the point to where the over-familiarity has entered into the beautiful area of the church, and people are being slain by the monster of permissiveness because they have not heeded the call of God or listened to His beautiful Word. Now, in reading to you, I read to you from Mark. I realized what I read to you from Mark had to do with the matter of a serious time in world history, possibly interpreted as the tribulation. It talked about the days being so severe that it would be possible that the very elect should be deceived. Many people have asked about the word elect, and I would like to give you an interpretation of the word elect. Actually, the word means chosen. Chosen of God. If you will follow the word to the root meaning, you'll find it means chosen. In fact, that word is actually used in Mark uh, 13 and 20. And it is used in other instances in the New Testament. I believe in the instances in the instance that we read it was referring to Israel out of Mark that the very elect of God would be deceived. I believe there are the chosen of God in the New Testament church. I believe God has his elect in all dispensations that he has a people that he has chosen for his specific purpose. If you want to detect First Timothy 5.21, you'd read about elect angels. I believe they are those who did not fall. And it also is used in regard to the church. In Matthew 20 and 16, you will find the portion of Scripture 
that reads in this fashion, and I'd like for you to note it, Matthew 2016, it talks about the call of God, and it tells us, so the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. If I am any observer of the English language, that tells me there's a difference between being called and being chosen. If you were to read in Matthew 22 and 14, you'd almost come up with the exact words. Just slightly different. And uh, if you would notice, for many are called, but few are chosen. And in the scriptures, I would like for you to note that the chosen of God, or the elect of God, are specifically endowed with something special. If you're reading Mark 13, you read the fact that the elect of God are spared the deception of the times, but if the days had not been shortened, it says the very elect would have been deceived. And it's talking about a serious time in world history. The point of the message that I want to bring to you tonight is to show you how the power of deception is loosed in this world to destroy God's chosen. I don't want to frighten you, nor do I want to cast a negative aspect about what I'm going to say in regard to the walk of God that you and I are enjoying, but I'd like to point out to you that the power of seduction is very strong in our world. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. I see no hope for the future when it comes from the lessening of the pressure of deception. And we are seeing deception coming from every avenue of life. We're seeing it at the top levels of political leadership. We're seeing it in the educational field. We're seeing it in the religious areas. And we're seeing it in the papers, in the blaring black headlines that tell us of a Diana. Deception of the worst kind. Somebody says, that won't happen to me. Who said that it won't? If there is this power of deception in the world, you and I must be prepared to meet with it. By the help of the Lord, I want you to be prepared tonight from the Scriptures. I would like to show you what I think is being chosen of God. In Acts 9 and 15, there is a statement that has to do with the Apostle Paul. If you will recall, he was struck down on the road to Damascus, and the Bible tells us in connection with the Apostle that the Lord had told Ananias, Go thy way, this is Acts 9.15, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. When did Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul, get chosen? I think you'll find the answer in the sixth verse of Acts 9. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And I am going to tell you tonight that when you come to the place in your life where you commit it all to God, then you are chosen, but not until. 
I want to repeat that to you tonight. You may love, but you're not chosen until you commit it all to Him. Saul of Tarsus had been struggling against the call of God. For that's what the first question, there are three questions here in Acts 9 that are very outstanding. The first question is, Who art thou, Lord? I like the answer. Who art thou, Jehovah, is what he is saying, and the answer is, I am Jesus. Then as you note, the question comes from the Lord. It is hard for thee to kick against the brick. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When Saul was persecuting the church, he was persecuting God. Your opposition to the church is not against man, it's against God. And we need to recognize that. Now, in the last uh, question, Saul asked, What wilt thou have me to do? And there was the man prone, spirit completely submitted, life completely committed, and he is saying, Tell me what to do. That's when you are chosen of God, when you can say, I'll do what you want me to do. There's a beautiful story about Abraham, and I'd like to call it your attention. When Abraham left the year of the Chaldees, he was told to leave his kindred and his home and his city and go to a country he didn't know what country. The Lord said, go to a country that I will show you. When Abraham left, he didn't leave his kindred. He took his father with him. I wondered many times when I saw Abraham go to that altar with Isaac, why did God make him go to that altar with Isaac? Because that was the one last thing the Lord had to prove in Abraham's life that he'd give the very best he had to God. When he laid that boy on that altar and that stiletto was held in his hand, ready to be plunged into that bosom, the angel of the Lord took that arm and said, Now I know that thou fearest the Lord. That's after many years of walking with God, I mind you, listen to what I'm saying. He had enjoyed special favors from God, but he had not fully committed. And when he fully committed, the reason why God made him lay that boy on that altar was because it was through that lineage that he'd get the chosen people of the earth. So he could not, could not permit him to be the lineage that was to be of God until he said, here's my boy. And then God honored him with the seed that was numerous as the stars and as the sign of the sea, the chosen of God. God is God. Oh, there's such beautiful things in the Bible. They teach us things about God that really burns into our heart. I am so concerned today about the matter of God's doing this trying hour. Why should there be a deception with the church? Or why should there be an attempt at deception with the elect or the chosen of God? There's going to be refined people in God's plan. If they do not go through tribulation, or if they do not go through the day of God's wrath, there is some 
thinking that there are those that feel they will go through portions of it, some feel that they will go through. That's not my desire for controversy at that point. But what I am saying is that somewhere a refining process will take place. And God will refine a people. We are living in the kind of world where we are being tempted. Sin is abounding and it's easy. You can get in trouble anywhere you want to. And it's with an open door. And now it's becoming acceptable to be shrewd and clever and manipulative in the way you deal with people. But that's not God's way. It's not God's way of doing things. It's not His way of righteousness. God has laid down a beautiful, straight path to follow. And He wants His people to walk in it. And He has always picked out people that learned how to walk with Him and how to harmonize their thinking with Him. But we are living in a time where we need to love the truth. I don't mean mental assent to it. I mean loving it with your mind, with your heart, with your actions, with your everyday conduct. Love the truth. I was standing at a teller's cage just a few weeks ago. I'd gone there to get some change. And I had placed some money there. And when I gave the lady the bill, which was for $100, to change in the smaller denominations, in her haste, she gave me $200 in 20s. I don't know what she was thinking of. She was preoccupied. I could see she was. And so when she handed me the money, I stood there and thought, well, that girl didn't even know that she handed me that much money. So I said to her, how much money did you give me? She said, a hundred dollars. She was really rude. I said, did you? She said, yes. So I just walked away from the palace cage just a little bit. And she growled at me. And so after she got with the next customer, I walked back. I said, how much money did you give me, ma'am? She said, dollars! I said, are you sure? She said, I am so sure of it that there's nobody here that convinced me differently. So I said, let me show you what you gave me. You gave me $200. And I just was amazed by the fact that you did. I said, here's a $100 that you'd have to put up at the end of your day. And I want you to have it. And she looked at me. She said, I'm going to say to you, sir, that if I had been on that side, I'd have gotten out of this bank. I said, you don't deserve your job. You know, this is the kind of spirit that's in the world. you got to love it at any cost. you got to love it and swear to your own hurt and change not. Oh, I hope I can drive that home in your heart tonight. You've got to love it with all your heart. Somebody said, what is truth? Let me give you a little essence of truth. And uh, this is just part of it. There's much that's related to it. Times change. I did with the hall brought it so beautifully today. Changing times. Changing cultures. The technocratic age. All the things that are part of the change. In the midst of the change, we still have a first century sun, a first century moon, a first century God, and they don't change. If they ever do change, it will be God that changes them. But while peoples change and cultures change and nations change, 
deteriorate and fail, God never changes. The same. Oh. Whom do men say that I the Son of Man? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon this rock, I like that. Rock means stability. I read many times of David saying, He is my rock. He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my foundation. Upon this rock will I build my church. On what rock? That Jesus is the Christ. And that never changes. That's truth. Did you hear me? That's truth. And you've got to love that truth, not with your mind only, with your soul, with your strength, with your affection. I like when this lady sung tonight here. She declared when she sung, she sung with mucho gusto. She sang with everything that's in her. You know, there's something about it. The Bible says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, with all thy strength, with all thy heart. And then they tell you not to get emotional in a religion. They don't know what they're talking about. My Lord in heaven, if you're going to love the Lord with all your mind and all your heart and all your strength, you've got to pour something into what you're doing. And if you're going to love him with all that, and he told that to a people who had never seen him, we have seen him. He has come in the flesh, and we have handled him, heard him, seen him, touched him. And we should love him with all that is within us. And we've got to love that truth. If necessary, die for it. I want you to read for me, Brother Hall, if you will, kindly, from Second Thessalonians 2 and 11. And I want you to notice how you and I can undergird our lives against this session today. And I want you to be saved, and I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to be walking with the Lord. I want to hear the cry of that trumpet. I want to hear that sound come up higher. I want to feel the weightless feeling of a raptured child of God. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I want you to notice, read for us the third verse of Second Thessalonians 2. Listen to this. Let no man deceive you by any means. Don't let any man, please, don't let somebody come along and throw some philosophy and vain deceit in your thinking. Don't let any man deceive you. Read. For that day shall not come. There's coming a day, the coming of the Antichrist. That day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first. Except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin and that be man revealed. of sin be revealed. There has to be an apostasy before the man of sin is revealed. I talked to you a little bit about that the other night. The apostasy has to do with going back on idealistic truth. We still hold on to truth. We say you must be honest. We say you cannot lie. We say you must believe in the one true and living God. We say that there's a life of a holiness before God. That's truth. It's durable. It stands. It meets the challenge of the times. It lives when everything else dies. Hallelujah. It's the undergirding foundation of the true church. Now, go down to 10th verse of that chapter and notice. And with all deceivableness. All right, here comes this deception again. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Of unrighteousness. In them that perish. In them that perish. And notice the description with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. The spirit of the age 
is so unrighteous until the unrighteousness becomes a deception where people who one time said, this is wrong, now say, it's all right. That's the deceivableness of unrighteousness. It's still wrong whether people give it credit for being wrong or not. It's still wrong, but it's deceiving. Because the Bible tells us many of these things from the beginning were as God stated they should be. Our age fits itself into the mold of the pattern of the time. And they will tell you that there is such a thing as situation ethics. And that situation ethics is to do what you need to do under the pressure of circumstances. It's all right to lie if it gets you out of trouble. That's the deceivableness of unrighteousness. That book says, swear to your own hurt and change not. Come on now. You and I need to know something about walking with God. It's one thing for a preacher to stand in this pulpit and preach about the things of God and then go home and act like a hypocrite behind the scenes. He's a deceiver. But when you love righteousness and love God, you go home and act like a Christian when you're out of the pulpit. Now, notice what it says. Because they received not the love of the truth. Oh, they didn't receive the love of the truth. They didn't get a love for it. I heard a man explain the, the, the great beauty, beauty of the mystery of God in Christ. And I said, do you love that? He said, I don't know if I love it or not. He said, it's a very interesting thing to think about in your mind. And I knew what he was saying. He was intellectually stimulated by the thought that God could be manifested in the flesh. But I love that. You love that. God was manifest in the flesh. This is the way David said it. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou, you made the moon and the, the stars and the sun with your hands, and have given him dominion over the work of thy hands. But what is man? Just what is man that you should be mindful of him in that condition? God wanted fellowship with man. And he poured his love on him at Calvary. And you and I ought to turn that love back to him and say, I love you with all my soul. Oh, you've got to love the truth. It is the undergirding foundation to save you in these serious times. Read it now. This is the tragedy of it. That they might be saved. And love for this cause. Love the truth that they might be saved. Now read. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie and be damned. Notice, they did not love the truth, and it doesn't say that they found delusion. God sent it to them. God sent them the delusion. Remember, friend, if you don't love him with all your heart, he'll send you something you will love. He'll give you a delusion that you will love. And you'd rather believe a lie than believe the truth. There are some people that would rather accept a lie than the truth. And that spirit of deception is all out in that world tonight. 
Everywhere you go, it's tugging at you. It's breaking in at you. It's working on your mind. It's eating at the vitals of your life. It's trying to say to you, don't give so much to God. Don't commit yourself so deeply. And even now, the world is getting to the place where they are entering the fray and saying they are fanatics. With the thing that has happened at Guyana, they're going to put you in the area of the cults. There is no such a thing as a cult in this New Testament gospel. This is not a cult. This is the way. This is the truth and the life. And when you and I have the way and the truth and the life, we've got to love it with all of our hearts. It's got to be a part of our breathing. It's got to be a part of our eating. It's got to be a part of our thinking. It's got to be a part of everything that we do. That's why Paul said, all that you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, so that you think Jesus, you eat Jesus, you walk Jesus, you've got Him on your mind. Oh, hallelujah. And the world will tell you you're a fanatic. I'll never forget the first time I, as a, a young man I went to a, I was selected by the uh, New York Journal to write a sports piece. Bill Corum at that time was the, uh, the sports editor of the New York Journal American. And I was attending journalistic school in New York. So I was selected to go with him. I was 16. And I went with him to report on this prize fight. This was B.C., before Christ. And uh, I went with him, and I was sitting in the third row around that squared ring. And uh, Mr. Corn was sitting next to me. The man behind me had bet some money on one of the gladiators. And, man, he was up and down, up and down. Hit him! And use your right, man. Come on. Don't lead with your right. Lead with your left. Come on, man. Get in and fight. He kept that up all night, and I bought a straw hat because I looked so young. I thought I ought to look a little older. I bought a little straw hat. He'd knock my hat off. I'd glare at him. I'd pick my hat up and put it back on. I'd say, can't you, can't you wash off of my hat? And he'd keep knocking that hat off. And finally, his man knocked the other man out in the fourth round. He hit him. Down he went. He grabbed my hat. He bit a chunk out of it and sailed it across the ring. And I'll never forget watching that hat sailing across the ring with a big chunk bit out of it. And then they call us fanatics. I've never bit anybody's straw hat. But I tell you what, I've got a champion on my hand. I'll tell you about my champion. He went down into the bottom of hell. He gave the devil a knockout blow. He took the keys of hell and death out of his hand. And he said, I have the keys of hell and death. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Oh, man. I'm a Jesus fan. Come on, you Jesus fans. you got to love the truth. I love my champion. He fixed it so no power could destroy me. He fixed it so no power could overcome me. He fixed it so I'd have a home in the near future. He set it up. So I could be one of his children, and he could be my God. I love him. 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 Oh, hallelujah. It's got to be in your system. It's got to be in your bloodstream. It's got to be in your mind. It's almost on the tip of your tongue all the time. You're ready to defend it any time any, anyone says anything about it. You're all ready to go. Man, I love it. I love it. I love that Jesus. I love Him. John said we love Him because He first loved us. Isn't that just like us? 
We wait for somebody to do something for us, and we say, isn't he great? That's the human about us. But he did it for us. He loved us before we were lovely. He loved us when we were lost. Became our propitiator. Became our conciliator. Became our substitute. Became our offscouring. Became a he-goat. Cast into the wilderness. Sent outside the communion of men. Put outside the gates of the fellowship of men. Went to the cross. Died for our sins. Uh, brought down the glory of God into the presence of man. Took your hand and took God's hand and put us together and said, Walk now. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's the truth. It's the truth that stands. And if you don't believe that, you'll believe a lie. Isaiah 66. Read the fourth verse. Isaiah, the last chapter, fourth verse. Listen. I will... I also will choose their delusions. I'll choose their delusions. And will bring their fears upon them. Bring their fears upon them. Because when I call, when I call, none did answer. None did answer. When I spake, when I speak, they did not hear. They did not hear. But they did evil before mine they eyes. They did evil before mine eyes. And chose that in which I delighted they not. They chose that in which I delighted not. That is the Old Testament Hebrew worship. They got perfunctory in their worship. They got to killing any kind of a lamb or a he goat, and they acted like it meant nothing. They draw, they drew nigh to the Lord with their lips, but their heart was far from Him, and He got sick of it. He said, I'll choose your delusions. Don't you come to me not recognizing who I am. When you come into my presence, come reverently. When you come into my presence, come with faith in me. Don't come perfunctorily. Don't come just out of habit. Don't come just out of a duty that you think is needing. Walk into the house of God. I'm glad to be in the house of God. I was glad when they sent unto me. Let us go to the house of God. I heart rejoice when they said, Let's go worship the Lord. Oh, but when it gets to the point, point where it's drudgery and it's a hard thing for you to do, you're going to find out that you don't love the Lord like you should. And He makes choose your delusion. And in saying He choose your delusion, He say, I'll bring your fears upon you. And everybody human has fears. you got fears about a lot of things. He let the very thing that you fear happen to you. And choose your delusions. Love the truth. Turn around to somebody and say, Come on, man. Love the truth. It's the devil's business to give us something that almost looks real. And deceive you into believing it. I want you to read for me from... Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Listen to this, please. And Nadab, Nadab, and Abihu, and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, took his censer, and put fire therein, put fire therein, and put incense thereon, put incense thereon, and offered strange fire, offered strange before, the fire Lord, before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Now, Nadab and Abihu were sons of Aaron, and they came into the presence of God with strange fire, which he commanded them not to do. Somebody asked me one day, he said, what was that fire? I don't know. But I do know what kind of fire they should have brought. Now, I don't know what fire that was, Brother Robinson, but I know what they should have brought. And when they offered that strange fire, what happened to them? And there went out fire from the Lord. There went out fire from the Lord. And devoured them. Devoured them. And they died before the Lord. The sons of Aaron the high priest died before the Lord. It doesn't make any difference what your name is. 
when you do it the wrong way, you're going to end up in tragedy, no matter what your background is. Sons of the high priest offered strange fire. What kind of fire should they offer? I'll tell you what kind of fire they should have offered. The fire from the brazen altar. They were told, don't let that fire go out. The fire from the brazen altar was taken to the lampstands. The golden candlesticks were lit by the fire from the altar of repentance. The fire on the altar of worship was lit by the fire from the altar of repentance. The fire they should have brought was the fire from the altar, the brazen altar of repentance. But they were doing it another way. When you do it another way, it's against the truth. And when you do it, you may die and perish in the misuse of your privilege. Years ago when the latter rain broke out, I had some folks come to talk to me and want me to join up. And I'll never forget what they said. They said, this is a new day. And we are going to lay down the doctrines that are controversial. We're going to lay down baptism in Jesus' name. We're not going to preach about it. We're not going to preach the oneness of God because it's controversial. We're not going to bring divisiveness to what they call the so-called body of Christ. And then they introduced the dirty bird doctrine. You never heard that one? Let me tell you about that one. The dirty bird doctrine was that Elijah was fed by unclean birds. Ravens fed Elijah. And they said, you don't have to be clean to preach. You can be anybody and preach the gospel, and you don't have to live a clean life. If ravens could feed Elijah, it means that you can be unclean and still feed the people. No, I don't believe that either. And when they started pulling that junk, I said, count me out. Count me out. You can take some things out of the Bible and twist them completely out of context and absolutely destroy the real meaning of things that belong to God. I want you to know, if those sons of Aaron could not bring the fire uh, that was right from God into the presence of God and be destroyed because of strange fire, you and I have got to come into the presence of God with the right kind of offering. And I want you to know, there's no offering or fire like the fire of repentance. Oh, you've got to come the way of God. And you've got to come clean with it. And you can't put any substitutes in it because God has a way. He told them, don't let that altar go out. Don't let that lampstand go out. Don't let that altar of incense, incense go out. Keep that fire burning. So those boys went out and got some fire somewhere. I don't know where they got it. I have an idea they picked it off some heathenistic altar. That's where I believe they got it. I believe they went over to some Baal altar and picked some fire out and brought that to God. I want you to know tonight there's only one way to get God in your life. And there's no substitute for it. No shortcuts to salvation. Everybody comes the same way. The high and the lofty, the poor and the little, they all come the same road. There's no difference by the way of repentance. And you can't offer any kind of strange fire when you come into the presence of God. But here we are living in the 20th century enlightened church age. Anything goes. Live any way you want to. Do anything you want to. Come back into the church and do not make any restitution for wrongs. My goodness, my friend, I've brought up with preachers that made you for restitution. If you stole something, they may take it back. Even if you stole it 20 years ago. 
I heard Brother W.T. Witherspoon make a man that stole some tools from a tool and die company. This man came and confessed and repented and told him that that was weighing on his conscience. He said, go get him. He went and got him. Brother Witherspoon went with him down to the, uh, the company where he worked, which had been years before. They walked in together, said, my man here has repented. He's been buried in the name of the Lord. He's been filled with the Holy Ghost. He wants to make restitution of wrongs he did. A man looked at him. He said, that's years ago. He said, it doesn't make any difference. It's on his conscience, and it's on his heart, and on his life, and he needs to get the whole thing clean before God. And we're here to deliver them into your hands. He delivered the tools into his hands. The man turned around, talked to some of the people about it, and as they were leaving the uh, leaving the uh, uh, the shop, they talked a little bit. The man had excused himself, gone off in a little office, sat down, wrote a little letter, put a check in an envelope, handed it to Brother Wisdom as he left. When they got back home, and said, "Keep on preaching, man. Maybe I'll get some more things back that were stolen from me years ago." And gave him a little offering to help the church. Oh, friend. That's the kind of preachers we used to have. We used to hear that kind of preaching, Brother Price. And now we've got it so that we fix it all up. You can come in the church with all your dirt and still not make a repentance. Tell me tonight, if you're going to come back to God, you've got to come clean. You know, you preach like this and you wonder whether or not the, you, 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 that you're living before your time. Actually, when you live in an age like this, you preach like this from the pulpit, and you look out at people, and they start to look at you. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of young people in this audience tonight. They look at you like you've lost your marbles. We haven't lost our marbles. No. We're telling you something that'll stand when the world's on fire. It'll stand when everything else goes down. That honesty before God will bring men to the place of beautiful sanctification in the presence of God. Those are the things that make the church. When you've got that clean spirit, you can go to singing. What was that song you were singing tonight? I'm going to hold out. Oh, who played the piano for that? I feel like singing, I'm going to hold out. Come on, I want to hold out right now. Who's, who's, get, get at the panel some way. Get somewhere where we can get the tune. I want you to hold out. How many want to hold out? I don't know when I'm get, going to get through preaching, but just be at ease, please. We may sing and preach the rest of the night. Praise God. Why not? Oh, 
Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. All right, you may be seated. You see, what's important here tonight is that we anchor ourselves in the truth that stands. We've got to do it. Oh, there's a deceptive spirit in the earth that's reaching for us. Let me point out something to you that comes from the New Testament, Second Corinthians 3 and 3. Brother Hall, if you read it, please. For as much yes. as... Ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. All right. Ministered by us. Yes. Written not with ink. N written not with ink. But with the Spirit of the living but God. But with the Spirit of the living God. Not in the table of stone. Not in tables of stone. But in fleshly tables oh, of the heart. Man. Mm. In the fleshly tables tables of the heart. We, as a movement, are at the point of actual decision. I want you to know what that decision is. The decision is whether or not we will let God inscribe the truths that we believe in our hearts. You see, we have preached for years some strong convictions to people all over our world. We've preached them in our cities, in our hamlets, in our rural communities. We've preached them over the radio. We've preached them on foreign mission fields. We've taken stands on issues that have to do with divorce and remarriage. We've taken stands on issues that have to do with holiness and righteousness. We've taken stands on issues of conduct of dress. We've taken a position that our women should not dress in apparel that was typical of man. And that includes the slacks and all the unisex clothing that is being developed by France. And also, we've taken a position that we do not uh, let men dress like women. We had a lady one time who said to me, she said, I think slacks are women's apparel. So I said to her, you do? And she said, yes. I said, how would you like to see me preach next Sunday in a dress? And she looked at me and said, oh, no, I wouldn't like it. I said, sister, you really wouldn't like it. Because if I dressed up like a lady, I'd be something strange walking out there. I said, you really wouldn't like it. And I said, I would look as odd as I could be standing out there with a dress on. And then I asked her the question. I said, since you say that slacks are not, uh, are not men's apparel, tell me, what in your wardrobe could I wear that would let me walk out and preach? If you don't want me in one of your dresses... What could I wear? She said, my slacks. I said, oh. Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, this is strange. This is strange to people. They want to stretch out on things. But when you look at these things fairly and squarely, it has a meaning to it. And I want you to know that that kind of thing needs to go out of our whole system. We need to cleanse ourselves of it. We need to get it out of our system. We need to get it out of our mind. And we need to be masculine and feminine to the very best degree that we can be. We stood for those convictions. But I tell you what, friend, if you don't get it written on your heart, it's not worth anything. It's got to get in your heart. 
You've got to love that way of life. You've got to love the feeling that goes with it. You've got to love the great desire that goes with pleasing God. And you've got to lay these things aside. Now, notice, this is why Paul writes, Ye are our epistles, read and known of all men, wherever you go, however you act, you are our credentials. You tell the world what we are. It's so beautiful to me when somebody walks up to you and says, I think you're a Pentecostal. There were about five men sitting in a restaurant not long ago. I was amongst them. Uh, a lady walked up. She was well-dressed. She wasn't a saint of God in any way. She said, can I ask you a question? And uh, we said, yes. She said, are you men Pentecostal? I said, why do you ask? She said, you look it. You asked it, said, I've been sitting here for about 30 minutes listening to your conversation. He said, she said, your conversation was all about the Bible. Said, you look like Christians. You act like Christians. And said, I figured there's only one group that acts like that. And it's Pentecostal. Said, have to be. So she asked us that question. Oh, I tell you what, I felt real good about it. So did all the brethren sitting there. They said, they shook hands with one another said, that really made our day. That made our day. That made our day. It's wonderful when you can stand out there. And then she made another observation about it. She said, and I noticed by your clothes that your clothes were becoming to you as men. They were not garments that were tight fitting. Now, some of our brethren are having a little problem with that because they've grown very large. But I'll tell you the truth. There is uh, the wonderful ability to look like a child of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go on. And you notice, you notice, you notice many times... Uh, we were sitting in a restaurant one time in Columbus, Ohio, and our precious wives were with us. And I heard a man behind us say, Oh, what beautiful hair those women have. What beautiful hair they have. And I said, Girls, listen, you're getting a compliment. And that man was saying, I wish my wife would let her hair grow long and beautiful like that. said, It would be the delight of my life to see her look like those women look. And those men were just going on about how beautiful those women were. And I said, man, that's great to hear people talk about the children of God like that. Out in this world tonight, that hungry world is looking for people just like you. Where are you, friend? One little girl that we met and brought to God, she said, where have you been all these years? I've been looking for you. I appreciate this so much. My boy worked for a company. Andy is 22. She came to my wife and I. She said, I was attracted to Andy. He didn't talk like the rest of the men. He didn't act like the rest of the men. He treated me like a gentleman. He always was courteous and nice. And he always wanted to talk to me about the Lord. And so she came to the church after he moved to Memphis and got baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, and told my wife, your boy walked with God in his company till I had to come find out where he had gone to. Oh, that made us feel good, Brother Price. That made us feel so good that Andy had carefully conducted his life in the front of people, and they had watched it. And it had meant something to somebody. This world needs a lot of this kind of thing. All over our communities, people walking and talking with God and brightening the light of this dark world. Read for me from Second Corinthians 4, if you will, please. 4, 1 to 2, listen to this. Therefore, yes. seeing we have received, we have this ministry. We have this ministry. As we have received mercy, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We faint not. 
but have renounced have renounced the hidden, hidden things, things of dishonesty. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Our ministry has to be pure clean. We can't use the pulpit as a manipulating force. We've got to be just as true as we can be. Amen. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. We have not walked in craftiness. Nor handling the word of God We deceitfully. have not handled the word of God deceitfully. We've tried to tell you what the book says. And it's beautiful what the book says. And we don't handle it in a deceitful manner to cover up or to hide something that's great and true. We tell you like it is. Do you appreciate it? Do you really appreciate it? This is the kind of ministry God gave to the New Testament church. Not a manipulative ministry. Not a, not a, uh, um, a ministry that is to have devious method of approach. Just preach that beautiful gospel. Everything about it is clean. Everything about it is good. Everything about it is wholesome. It's got power in it. It'll do the job. It'll get in the hearts of men. So we renounce the hidden things of dishonesty and just come forth with good, clean, solid gospel. Praise God. Good, solid gospel. Read. But by manifestation of the truth, ah, by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves, commending ourselves to every man's to conscience. Every man's conscience. We have let God. the truth with you, and you must let God work it out in your heart. Now here we are tonight, and you've been very, you've been very uh, attentive, and I want to just say a few things more. We are here tonight to tell you that we have done our best to bring you the truth. I am going to tell you as a United Pentecostal Church minister, I am not going to say to you that the organization is the uh, epitome of excellency. Those of us who are acquainted with the matters of structural organization understand that there's imperfections in that. We understand that. We're not, we're not telling you that we are the essence of all holiness. That is impossible for us to stand here and tell them, Brother Price, that is not the way to do it. But we are, by the help of God, trying to keep it clean. We're trying to keep it right. We're trying to keep it wholesome. We're trying to keep the truth in it. We're trying to make people do the thing that will honor God. We're trying to make our preachers ethical. We're trying to make them understand that they've got to treat their brethren as brethren. That they've got to be honest when they handle the Word of God and honest in their dealings with people. That's what makes it a strong church. The structure of organization may be a structure for matter of reaching the world with an evangelical thrust, but it doesn't have God in it. It doesn't mean a thing. So I'm telling you tonight, we are standing at the threshold of great power and authority, in the authority that God can give us as the church. But we are also standing at a crisis stage because deception is out there. And it wants to water down our gospel. It wants to water down our convictions. It wants to water down our stand. It wants to take away our position on the name of God. It wants to take away our position on holiness. By God's grace, we're going to hold up that banner. And let the world know there's a reason for it. It's not just some kind of a concept we dreamed up in our mind. There's a biblical script of backing for it. And we're taking the stand because of it. Now notice the deception. Revelation 13 and 11. I want you to see this. I want you to notice it. And I beheld another beast. I beheld another beast. Coming up out of the earth. Coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns. He had two horns. Like a lamb. Like a lamb. And he spake. As a dragon. He looked like a lamb, but he talked like a dragon. He looked like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. And the deception is here. Would you mind me telling you something tonight that just shocked me to my very soul? David Duplessis, who is called Mr. Pentecost in Trinitarian circles, 
recently made the statement that he believed the Pope was infallible. He made that statement. He has been going to Vatican gatherings as a representative of Pentecostals, and he has let that fellowship turn him into a thinker that that man that sits on the throne at Rome is an infallible person. There is a deception in this world that can take away from you the very beautiful thing that first gave you the glory of God. And with due respect to any leader, religious or otherwise, my complaint and my battle is not with the false church from the standpoint of their falsity. It's apparent. You can see it. You don't have to guess about it. You can know it. But when you begin to fellowship in areas where you don't belong, you are asking for deception. You are asking for deception. You are asking for destruction. I don't care what your name is, how big you are, you can't play on the devil's territory and keep a clean gospel. Oh, yes. Oh, friend. Talks, looks like a lamb, but talks like Satan. His, his approach has always been the same. Genesis 3, 4, and 5. Brother uh, Hall, if you will, notice how the devil talks. He has talked like this all the ages. He hasn't changed his tactics. He's still talking like this tonight. Just like this. And the serpent said unto the woman. Serpent said unto the woman. You shall not surely die. You won't surely die. For God doth know. God knows. That in the day ye eat thereof. When you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened. Your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as God. And you shall be as God. Knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. You know what he said to the woman? God's Word doesn't mean all it says. God knows that you should t partake of that tree. He's denying you some privilege. He's talked like that all through these years. He's talking to young people in our movement tonight saying, that church is denying you some privilege. No, no, no. We're denying you nothing. We're keeping you from the stain of the world. We're keeping you from the viciousness of the world. We're keeping you from the defilement of the world. We're keeping you from the things that will destroy you. And we know whereof we speak. We're not talking out of the top of our head. That's deceptive out there. And we're telling you that that's the way the devil talks. And he will come in the last days the same way. He looks like a lamb, but he talks like a dragon. And a lot of things look nice. And they look real good. And we have seen some people today who have received what they feel is a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I believe God has poured the Holy Ghost on some people. But the Holy Ghost has been given to you to lead you and guide you into all truth. And if it doesn't lead you to Jesus, and if you won't let it lead you to Jesus... And if you have found yourself bound with a fettered condition where you won't let it lead you to Jesus, and if traditionalists have a hold on you, and they're trying to soak a Trinitarian theory into your mind when the Holy Ghost wants you to glorify Christ, then you better drop your tradition and let the Holy Ghost have its way. Because there is the Spirit of God that leads and guides you into all truth. Oh, I love it. I love it. And it's, it's possible to be deceived by these conditions that are part of our generation and time. Read for me from the Psalms. This is a beautiful portion of Scripture. Listen to this. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Isn't that beautiful? Who's going to stand in his holy pl place? He that hath what? He that hath clean hands. Everybody say clean hands. All right. And a pure heart. And what? A pure heart. Say a pure heart. And who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. He hath not lifted himself to vanity. He's not on an ego trip. Nor sworn deceitfully. Nor sworn deceitfully. That's the man that's going to stand in the hill of God. 
clean hands, pure heart. He has not lifted himself up to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He's wholesome from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, inside and outside. Old Brother Blankenship used to say, Stick a knife in me! Pull it out and smell it! It's apostolic. Stick it in me a little further and take it out and smell it again. It's apostolic. Push it all the way through me and then pull it out again. And it'll smell apostolic all the way. <laughs> I heard that old man say that years ago, and I've never forgotten it. I tell you, we need to be apostolic in skin, apostolic on the inside, apostolic all over us, from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. We will not swear deceitfully. People can count on our word. They can die by our word because they know we tell the truth. And that's the answer to a deceptive age. Walk out there and let them know you're telling the truth and you wouldn't bend it for anything. One of the finest letters I ever received, I received from the head of the Republican Party in the city of Indianapolis, Mr. Keith Buellen. He wrote this on the 25th anniversary of our pastoral uh leadership in the city of Indianapolis, he wrote and said, Dear Brother Urshan, I've watched your church, watched your family, watched your wife, watched you. We want to tell you that you have never let down your standards. And we appreciate it in this city that church is a lighthouse. Don't move it. Leave right there. Tell us what you want. And we'll let you have it. I said, change the name of the street to Calvary. They changed it to Calvary. I said, give us an exit sign that says Calvary exit. They gave us a Calvary exit sign. I took advantage of it. If he's going to ask me about it, I'm going to take advantage of it. And I want you to know the beautiful thing about it is that he said one day, he said, years from now we'll drive by here and say, look what we did for the Lord. And the man is as wicked as he can be. But it's amazing. It's beautiful to let God have his way in your life. How many love to walk with the Lord? Praise the Lord. Love to walk with the Lord. One more scripture, or I'll have you here all night. Turn around. Turn around to somebody and say, that man's long-winded, would you? Please. Oh, Lord, you know it. Come back, Brother Robinson. It's about time to close. Praise God. All right. I want you to notice in the uh, book of Corinthians, I want you to notice what it says here. Be ye not unequally yoked together. Ah, oh, be not unequally yoked together. With unbelievers. With unbelievers. For what fellowship? What fellowship? Hath righteousness with unrighteousness. None. And what communion hath light with darkness? None. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Not a bit! And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Nothing! And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Nothing! For ye are the temple yes. of the living God. Yes! For God hath said, God hath said, I will dwell in them. I'll dwell in them. And walk in them. Walk in them. And I will be their God. I'll be their God. And they shall, they shall be, be my, my people. people. Wherefore? Wherefore, come out from come among them. Come out from among them. And be a separate. Be a separate. Say the Lord. Say the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. I'll receive you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let me do a little dance for the truth. Let me dance for the truth. You dance for music. I'll dance for the truth. Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord. Hallelujah! Let the world know who the church is today. Let them understand what the glory of God's all about. God will pour His glory on that church if we'll let Him have His way in our life.
It will approach this thing with honesty and with true clarity. Oh, the 